Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us today for our GSA Schedule webinar. We'll be discussing requirements, risks, and rewards of the GSA Schedule. My name is Jennifer Schaus, and I'm coming to you live from Washington, D.C. today. This webinar is being recorded. It will be available later today on our website, and we're also happy to send out the slides. A brief uh, rundown here on the agenda. We'll go through a little bit uh, about us, talk uh, at various uh, levels about the GSA schedule, including, again, the requirements, risk, and rewards. I'll share some candid thoughts, and then happy to take any questions at the end. If you do have questions, you can type them in on the lower right-hand side of the control panel, and we'll answer those in the order that they're received. So a brief rundown about us. We're based in downtown D.C. We've got uh, a variety of services, including market analysis reports that would let you know which agencies are buying your product or service, uh, when they're purchasing, how much, what the competitive landscape looks like, and more detail. Additionally, we do help with 8A certification, GSA schedules, uh, proposal writing, and additional services that are listed there. Uh, we do also put on various networking events for government contractors, trainings, uh, these webinars, and conferences. You can find those on our website. If you follow us on YouTube, we've got probably over 50 or 60 government contracting topics. Uh, we did a webinar series a couple months ago uh, that touched on anything from uh, the Service Contract Act to cybersecurity requirements. Uh, all of our presentations are also posted on LinkedIn. Our newsletter goes out typically every Monday and hits about 11,000 subscribers. Uh, we usually post our events, upcoming events, conferences, uh, and any news that's applicable to the government contracting industry. You can sign up on our website for that. Uh, there's no cost to join our newsletter. Uh, we do support small businesses at various uh, incubators in the local D.C. Uh, metropolitan area as both a mentor uh, and or a uh, educator or trainer, and some of those are listed there. Uh, other resources for entrepreneurs and small businesses, uh, you certainly want to reach out to your SCORE or PTAP, uh, the Small Business Development Centers. Uh, incubators are a great place for uh, finding potential partners and getting educated, uh, as well as mentorship. Uh, your Chambers of Commerce, particularly in the D.C. metropolitan area, typically have a government contracting division. They will usually host some sort of event. And then if you do hold any socioeconomic uh, indicators, there's the Hub Zone Council, the 8A Association, uh, there's various women's groups and veterans groups, all of these dedicated to government contracting. A simple search on Google would, uh, would help uh, find some of those. Uh, within the federal agencies, you have the OSDBUS, which is the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. They typically have, I'll call it an open house or industry day for small businesses. Those are also good resources for entrepreneurs and small businesses that are just starting up. Uh, a quick promo here, at the end of uh, the month, we are hosting, it's our second annual doing business with DOD and the Intel community. It is a conference, uh, so we're going to have a variety of speakers, as well as a pretty interesting panel discussion. We'll have a uh, perspective from both investors, small businesses, uh, a prime contractor from Mantech, uh, and small business veteran perspective. You can register either on our website or by using the link that's posted there on these slides. Okay, so let's talk about GSA schedules. A quick overview here. What is a GSA schedule? So uh, to get onto the schedule, you're actually replying to an RFP, a request for proposal, and you can find that on the fedbizops.gov website, or you can um, move through the GSA website, which will eventually take you there. Schedules are sometimes referred to as multiple award schedule, MAS. Uh, it just means that there are multiple awards, meaning multiple companies that hold the schedule. Um, currently, there's about 18 to 20,000 companies that do hold GSA schedules. It's also referred to as FSS or an IDI2, meaning that there is a indefinite delivery of what an indefinite quantity of what the government would be purchasing from you. Uh, this is typically, GSA schedules typically um, are best suited for companies that do have experience and past performance. Uh, if you're a startup, there certainly are exceptions. Um, 
but in our uh, experience over the years, it's typically not in your best interest. So as you respond to this RFP, you're going to have to provide a lot of information. Your company will be extremely uh, vetted and carefully vetted by GSA. Most of the evaluation is based on the pricing of your products or your services. Uh, the GSA schedule, it's a contract vehicle, meaning it's a mechanism for the government to purchase from you. Uh, I also like to refer to it as just a vendor shortlist. Um, you're selling bulletproof vests or IT services, it doesn't matter. GSA can go onto the gsaadvantage.gov website, type in whatever they're looking for, similar to say eBay or Amazon, and get a list of all the companies that sell those services. Uh, so they, they get a list of those uh, vendors that have been approved by GSA. The GSA schedule is absolutely, absolutely not required to do business with the government. It is only a marketing tool. It's a feather in your cap. It's a ticket to the dance. You still need to find a dance partner. Uh, it is one of many, many ways that the government purchases. Uh, various federal agencies have their own contract vehicles. Uh, so if you're selling to Navy, there's something called Navy Seaport E. If you're selling to NASA, there's something called NASA Soup. Uh, and the lists go on and on and on. Uh, GSA schedules do, um, or the GSA uh, allows state, local, and Red Cross, World Bank, United Nations, uh, IMF, IFC, uh, to purchase off of the schedule. The customer may not notice, um, and there are certain exceptions. Um, but it certainly can uh, can help, especially if you have a multi-pronged approach to selling to the government if you're hitting both federal and state and local. Uh, once you're on the schedule, uh, your contract is good for five years, and then there are three five-year renewable periods after that. So if you meet all of the terms and conditions, because the schedule is a contract, in essence, from start to finish, it's a 20-year contract. Uh, at the end of the 20 years, you can apply to get back onto the schedule. So unlike uh, perhaps the 8A program where once you wrap up the nine years, you're not eligible again to uh, reapply for 8A, GSA, you can hold multiple schedules. You can, um, you can reapply at the end of your term. Uh, about $40 billion uh, worth of purchases run through the schedule. Uh, but I will note with that uh, the next line there, the, only used about 10 to 15 percent of the time in federal purchases. So a very small portion of the time GSA schedules are used, and I would keep this in mind. I already mentioned there's about 18 to 20,000 companies that hold GSA schedules. Uh, and the way that the schedules program uh, is organized, they are all um, segmented by your offering. So if you are selling a uh, bulletproof vest, you would fall under Schedule 84, which is for security and law enforcement. And every schedule will have something called a special item number, or a SIN number. And every SIN has, uh, it just further identifies what it is you're offering. So if you think of it as an outline, it's just uh, one more uh, letter or number in that outline. So for example, GSA Schedule 70 is for IT products and services. These are just two of the many SIN numbers uh, that that schedule offers. So should you decide to pursue the schedule, you need to figure out what schedule your product or your service fits on, and then more specifically, what SIN number. And every SIN is going to have, a, again, a description that you will need to meet those requirements. The main focus, and I cannot highlight, highlight this enough, is that GSA schedules are primarily based on price specifically your lowest prices. So as you're replying to this RFP and putting your proposal together, um, you will then be subject to uh, disclosing who your uh, lowest price customer is, the discounts that you've given to them, identifying who that most favorite customer is, and indicating what that lowest price is for each line item. Additionally, GSA will also review your pricing with other companies that are already on the schedule. And there are ways, uh, because once you're on the schedule, you're required to post your price list, your GSA price list. So uh, it would be in your best interest to do this before you decide to get onto the schedule, making sure that your prices are in sync with the other vendors on the schedule. 
So the advantage of being on the schedule is that your rates uh, are pre-negotiated. It makes it easier for the buyers to come directly to you and either swipe their card, submit a purchase order, uh, or in certain occasions, based on dollar threshold, uh, potentially put some of these GSA purchases uh, out for bid. Uh, I would suggest looking up the FAR for that. We did a webinar on uh, GSA schedules and purchases through the schedule. You can find that on our website under the webinar section. Again, it's primarily based on your pricing. GSA wants your rates to be equal to or preferably lower than your MFC, meaning your most favorite customer who is your lowest price customer. Okay, part two uh, gets into the uh, requirements. So your company should have two two full years of balance sheet and income statement. So two full years of sales revenue. And I would suggest that your company have significant revenues. If you're just starting out, again, this is probably not in your best interest. Uh, your SAM record needs to be current and you need to have the corresponding NAICS codes, your industry codes for the SIN that you're pursuing. Um, this slide here actually touches on the administrative section of the proposal. Uh, you'll need to complete two kind of, I'll call them GSA tests or forms that are available on the GSA website. One is the pathway to success. Give yourself about 30 minutes to 60 minutes to complete that. The readiness assessment will also uh, ask you some questions and require that you do some research on other vendors on the schedule. Uh, give yourself maybe an hour or two to complete that. You also have to submit an org chart, so if you're the only employee, this uh, GSA schedule is not going to uh, work for you. Um, the next section actually of the proposal is the technical section, and this is where you'll submit a corporate narrative answering specific GSA schedule questions, and same thing with the quality control, you'll be answering GSA specific questions. So you want to make sure that your company meets those uh, requirements that are uh, asked in each of those sections. You also need a formal accounting system, something that can um, ensure that GSA customers are getting your lowest rates and that you can differentiate between your GSA schedule sales versus non-GSA schedule sales. Your company will also need to be able to accept credit cards. You'll need to have a couple full-time employees. Uh, but more importantly, you'll need past performance for each of these SIN numbers that you're pursuing. Um, most SINs only require two uh, past performances or contracts uh, that you've worked on within the last two years that are relevant to that write-up for the SIN. Um, there are some exceptions that require three uh, past performance uh, projects. You'll need to submit a copy of the contract, so if you guys are working on anything that uh, is cleared or uh, uh, kind of high-level top secret that you're not allowed to produce the copy of the contract, you're then not going to be able to use that as your past performance. You'll need to have six, and I'll call this uh, quote unquote happy customers to complete an open rating survey. Uh, open ratings as an independent company that will survey your customers to ask about how your customer service is, how your pricing is, how your uh, responsiveness to questions is, and so forth. Those six customers, you should be including the folks that you used in that past performance uh, narrative, uh, as well as. Uh, three or four additional to uh, to come up with six, and that's the minimum. You also need an invoice to justify every single line item that you're proposing, whether you have labor categories, meaning you're providing services, or if you're a product company. In the event that you are a product company, you'll need product sheets um, from literature just describing what it is that you're selling. Uh, for labor categories, you'll need descriptions, which will include a job description minimum number of years experience, and minimum education. And that's for every single uh, labor category. If you are providing professional services, you'll need a copy of your HR policy that includes how your employees are compensated, uh, as well as your policy on overtime, which needs to be in accordance with federal requirements, which is time and a half. For the product companies, uh, you need to ensure that your products are Trade Agreement Act compliant, TAA, that list of countries sometimes changes. You also need to have a plan in place to monitor that. Uh, same thing with Ability One. Again, for product companies only, you need to make sure that the Ability One folks under Unicor are not producing 
using any of the same products that you are. If so, you cannot list them on the schedule, and this list will change. You'll need to have a policy in place on how you monitor that. Software companies will need your uh, EULA, that's your end user license agreement. Uh, professional services companies, uh, if there are any of your labor categories that are Service Contract Act applicable, you'll need to go to the Department of Labor Table 5, uh, Table 5 uh, form and ensure that your rates are in sync with those. If you are providing products and you are not the manufacturer, you'll need a letter of supply from the manufacturer. I would make a note here, uh, very important, make sure in advance of pursuing the GSA schedule that your manufacturers are going to be okay with providing this to you. Uh, additionally, you'll need your price list, whether you're providing commercial rates or market rates. So for every single item that you are proposing to GSA, you'll need a commercial or market rate for that item or that service. And then the, uh, the last part here of the, uh, this pricing section is your GSA price proposal where you will basically do a comparison of your commercial rates to your most favorite customer rates to your GSA rates. And your GSA rates, again, should be your uh, lowest rates. Some other uh, forms that come into play in the proposal uh, are the summary of offer and then your commercial sales practices. This is where you're going to, again, open the kimono and share who you are pro providing discounts to, the frequency, uh, and what those discounts are, and then also name those uh, most favored customer uh, customers. If you're a large business, you'll need to provide a subcontracting plan. This is uh, required, so a certain percent of your business will need to go to small, women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, 8A, uh, and all the, the other set-asides. Some of the terms and conditions within the actual GSA schedule contract, you'll need to bring in at least 25,000 per year per schedule, not per your SIN number, but per schedule. So if you're just pursuing one schedule, that's $25,000. Most companies say, hey, that's not a problem. Uh, our typical uh, sale is $25,000. But you may have a contract or you, you've sold maybe $5 million uh, worth of your product or your services to Department of Agriculture, or Department of Defense, whoever it was. However, if those customers did not purchase through the schedule, GSA doesn't care. Um, these, this 25K needs to go through your schedule. If you don't meet the sales requirement, GSA will cancel your schedule. So this is something that we're going to touch on in more detail uh, a little bit later in the uh, presentation, but you want to make sure that you have a pipeline full of customers that specifically want to purchase from you, but even more specifically through your schedule. Some ongoing reporting and compliance includes paying the industrial funding fee, which is going to be 0.75% of your GSA schedule sales. So in that same example, you've got a $5 million sale to Department of Defense, but you have zero sales through your GSA schedule. What do you owe GSA? Nothing. However, if that $5 million was through your schedule, good for you. You'll owe GSA 0.75% of that number. Uh, some ongoing uh, compliance also includes ensuring that your invoices indicate which of your which line items are GSA versus non-GSA. Uh, maybe you have uh, 10 labor categories that you're invoicing, but only six of them were approved on your schedule. Uh, this will get kind of tricky on your invoices, uh, but you want to make sure that you have designated something within your accounting system to be able to decipher between those. Uh, mass mods, these are the GSA-initiated mods that they will sometimes make updates to the solicitation. Uh, those are typically sent to you from um, the contract uh, officer uh, via email. It will have a link and a passcode. Uh, you'll go on to the vendor support center that GSA uh, provides, accept the new terms and conditions, and plug in your passcode. You want to make sure that you do a good job of maintaining those files and those records. Uh, the other type of modification is your own initiated modifications, meaning you need to uh, change your prices, you want to add a new SIN number, you want to add a new product, you want to add a new labor category. You also need to keep uh, track of those as well. Uh, the other important piece here is the price reduction clause. 
uh, this in short is really just ensuring that GSA is always your lowest price customer. Uh, if anybody outside of your GSA scheduled purchases gets a lower price, something in your accounting system should be uh, ringing, bells should be ringing, smoke should be coming out of the uh, system, you'll then be required to notify GSA and lower your GSA rates to that same amount. Uh, you're also going to need to maintain your GSA price list as well as your terms and conditions. So there is obviously a cost of doing business. Some of the risk here, uh, and this is not meant to scare you, these are just the realities of working with GSA. So your pricing might actually be too low uh, for the schedule to really be beneficial to you. Uh, the reason I say that, again, GSA, as I mentioned, is trying to obtain equal to, uh, but in most cases, better than your most favorite customer pricing. So they're also going to compare your rates to others on the schedule. Once you're on the schedule, your GSA rates are only a price ceiling. So as you start bidding uh, for items or services through your schedule, you will be coming in at rates typically lower than your GSA rate. So the numbers are just going to keep going down, down, and down. There is a website uh, called Calc for a calculator, calc.gsa.gov, and this is where uh, I suggest going in advance of deciding to get onto the schedule to ensure that uh, if you are providing professional services that your rates are in sync with others on the schedule. Uh, otherwise, GSA is going to scratch their head and say there's no reason for us to allow you on the schedule when we can buy these same services from uh, 200 other companies that are selling the same thing, uh, all things being equal. So what I did here, this is a screenshot, obviously I plugged in just a very common uh, LCAT for program manager. I didn't put any uh, filters in this. Um, so on average rate, this is uh, basically all schedules, um, all levels of experience, and, uh, and all, all business sizes. But you could actually filter this out by program manager who has a bachelor's degree and 10 years of experience. Uh, for a small business, and you can also, uh, one of the other filters that uh, I think got cut off here is the actual SIN number. Uh, so you could pick, if you are an IT firm, you would pick uh, Schedule 70, 132-51, which is the SIN number for IT professional services. So this uh, is just further down on the screen. Uh, tells you all the companies that have this LCAT. Uh, you can sort that by education, experience, price, and so forth. Um, all of these that, um, that just popped up that were able to fit on the screen do not include the IT schedule. It's a consolidated schedule, which is professional services, the PES schedule, which is professional engineering services. Um, but again, you can uh, use those parameters on the right-hand side to filter. Uh, or you can use this to potentially come up with your own rate. Again, what was that website, calc.gsa.gov. Uh, if you are a product company, uh, the GSA advantage.gov is a helpful site. You can also sort that by schedule and SIN number and look at other vendors that are providing similar products to you. Again, I highly suggest doing that uh, before you decide to pursue the schedule. And that's a, a website that anybody can go on. Uh, both of these are. It's uh, publicly available information. Again, do this before you decide to get onto the schedule because if your rates are too high, uh, there's real no, no real reason for you to pursue the schedule. Some of the risk here uh, as we continue, this is just more of a, um, uh, a reality uh, check here. So let's say you've got a commercial rate of $200 for the program manager uh, or perhaps the widget that you're selling. You disclose to GSA that your most favorite customer is getting a $5 discount, coming in at $195. So in your proposal that you submit to GSA, uh, your rate for that uh, widget or that uh, hourly rate is $190. Let's move over to the right, which is the second box. GSA is now going to evaluate your proposal. And they go to that Calc website, uh, which you probably should have done in advance. and the the, uh, the average rate that comes up for this widget or for your uh, hourly rate is 180. And that's using the same SIN number, uh, all things being equal. So GSA says, hey, we don't like your 190. Everybody else on the schedule is more or less at 180. 
Uh, so we're going to award you uh, the labor category for the program manager uh, at 180. So as you start bidding for work for your schedule for this widget or this LCAT, you will start bidding typically at a rate of maybe 179, 178. So we're all in business to make money. And obviously you can see that those profit margins uh, are going to be a little bit lower than what your commercial rate is. Can your business be sustained uh, with these lower rates? Some additional risk, you're going to have limitations on when you can make price increases, um, the frequency as well as the amount that you can increase your rates. Uh, there's obviously a cost of doing business, which I alluded to earlier. I suggest that you have a full-time sales and business development person that not only knows your business, but also knows GSA schedules and federal contracting. Uh, being on the schedule does not negate the need for having a proposal writer. Uh, so you will still need to respond to RFPs um, that come out uh, just for the schedule holders. It's not always the case, um, but you want to make sure that you have somebody that is able to, uh, to write. The back office costs are going to include all the reporting and compliance that I mentioned earlier. GSA uh, also conducts audits. They, um, they don't call it an audit. They call it a customer-assisted visit. Um, but they will be looking at invoices. Uh, give yourself at least a good day or two to prepare for that. Uh, and then it's spending a half a day with them. Sometimes these are now actually conducted uh, over email or a, a WebEx. Your renewals will take some time and effort as well. Uh, as well as the modifications, again, the GSA modifications, as well as your own modifications. You'll need to monitor pricing to ensure that every customer outside of GSA is getting, is not getting a lower rate than GSA. So some of the rewards. You will have access to special, uh, I'll call them RFPs and RFQs, um, and this is once you are on the schedule, GSA eBuy is one of the systems where you can list up to, I believe it's 10 contacts within your company. Uh, each of those 10 contacts will then receive a notification via email anytime uh, somebody within the government wants to, um, to purchase something. Uh, and those will be over certain dollar thresholds. They vary by the SIN number uh, when things will go out for bid or not, or if they want to buy directly. It's also a status symbol that's going to show that you're serious, that you've been in business for at least two years, you've got some full-time employees, um, and it does somewhat limit the competition. It will not eliminate it, but it's a smaller pool of companies. It does not guarantee any sales. Uh, in fact, as I mentioned earlier, it comes with that 25K sales quota. Another benefit, uh, particularly for your customers, is going to be it's going to reduce the paperwork uh, for the contracting officer. So we know that these folks are pretty busy, um, and the less time that uh, they have um, to spend on purchasing from you, then the better. So if you can make it easier for them, the GSA schedule uh, can certainly be a benefit. Uh, your products and services are, we'll call it kind of free marketing, uh, via GSA Advantage website. Um, so, again, think of that kind of like an Amazon or, or eBay. Uh, because the government is a risk-adverse purchaser uh, and you've been vetted by GSA forwards and backwards and upside down and, and every which way, it gives them some confidence in purchasing from you. Uh, but, again, it's not going to guarantee any sales. It's just a marketing tool. Um, but it will give them confidence enough to, um, to possibly make you the, the prime contractor. Um, and then the large businesses will also have confidence as well, knowing that you just didn't start your business yesterday, that you know what you're doing, uh, and that GSA has kind of, let's say, checked you out. Some of my candid thoughts about uh, the schedule, and this is the primary service that we offer to clients. Um, so I would say if you're going to pursue the GSA schedule, make sure that you've done the math, uh, you've done the homework, uh, is your business still going to be profitable on this uh, schedule? Make sure that your customers have told you that you've got at least three or four customers that said, hey, we want to buy your, your widget or your service, uh, but specifically through the schedule. Um, make sure that you also exceed the requirements. As I mentioned, some startup companies, there are certain schedules 
uh, that do have exceptions to that. Um, but I don't uh, typically recommend that um, for uh, for as a as a primary strategy. Um, again, it's not required to do business with the government, and it is again only a marketing tool. Um, there are other ways that the government purchases. Uh, those are listed there. Anything from simplified acquisitions to sole source and other agency-wide contracts that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Navy Seaport E, NASA Soup, and every agency probably has one or, or two, uh, DHS Eagle, and, and the list go on and on. So uh, I think a, a wise decision would be who's your customer and how do they purchase? Um, and are you even going to be profitable on the schedule with these lower rates? So here's just a, a nice visual uh, on uh, how the government purchases. This isn't comprehensive. It just uh, was for a market analysis report that we did for a customer, and these, this was some of the data that we came back with. Uh, doing something like this, you guys can do this on your own, looking at uh, FTDS, the Federal Procurement Data System, again, FTDS.gov, uh, doing some research on how your products or services are purchased. Uh, and if it comes back that they're not using the GSA schedule, I'd say, then uh, perhaps pursue another contract vehicle or another mechanism. Um, there still are many procurements that go out for full and open competition. If any of these uh, are of interest to you as far as simplify acquisition, set asides, we've done webinars on these. Uh, again, a few months ago, they're all available as complimentary downloads on our website under the webinar section. So because your, uh, your rates are going to be lower, you will need higher volume, meaning more customers to purchase from you through the schedule. So uh, basically, you would fall into box three. Um, if you think you're selling to the government and you're going to have high margins, um, you've, uh, you're mistaken. Um, so that kind of puts you out of one and two. Um, and if you're in box four, where you don't have that many customers uh, through the government, and you still have low margins, uh, GSA schedule is not going to be right for you. Having the uh, strategy of, hey, we're going to get on the schedule, and uh, it'll be like uh, bees going to honey, uh, you know, build it and they will come, it's not always the, uh, the best decision. Um, so make sure that you have a strategy in place that your pipeline is filled with uh, potential customers that want to buy from you uh, through that mechanism. When we get these calls that people say, hey, I've got a schedule, but nobody's buying through it, um, well, what would be a smart thing? Don't pursue the schedule until you know that you've got customers that are going to buy through it. Um, again, having a full-time sales and BD person uh, prior to getting on the schedule is certainly helpful. Um, so your, your business needs to have some revenue generation um, in advance, as well as during the process and afterwards to implement your sales strategy of selling through your schedule. Don't rely on the schedule to fill your pipeline. Uh, again, it should be filled prior. And the schedule is certainly not for everyone. It should be a business decision. I'm happy to take your questions now. Um, what I list here is my question back to you all. Can your business afford a GSA schedule? And I'm not talking about can you afford to hire a law firm, a consultant, uh, or anybody to help you with the schedule. I'm saying can your business, can your profit margins afford uh, the GSA schedule rates that you would potentially have? Uh, is this going to be an asset or liability? Again, I direct you back to the, uh, the Calc site if you're providing professional services or the GSA Advantage website um, if you're providing products. Okay, so the first question, uh, let me move that off of here. Um, I think we have no questions. So if anybody does have questions or wants copies of the uh, presentation, we're happy to provide those to you. And I will uh, thank you again for joining the webinar. Again, if we can be helpful to you, you can contact us directly at the phone number or by email. Thank you.